Hi, and welcome to Chapter 16, Current Liability Management. In this chapter, we are going to be talking about accounts payable, credit terms, stretching accounts payable, accruals, interest rates, short-term loans, commercial paper, international loans, short-term international loans, secured short-term loans, accounts receivable, short-term loan collateral, so let's start off with spontaneous liabilities. What are spontaneous liabilities? Well, these are basically um, financing that's going to occur during the normal course of business within a year. So the two major short-term sources of such liabilities would be accounts payable and accruals. So when we talk about spontaneous liabilities, the two accounts we'll be talking about for the majority of the time are accounts payable and accruals. Now, unsecured short-term financing, you know, this is obtained without pledging any specific assets, collateral, or, or um, terms. So, uh, this is an interest-free, unsecured source of financing. Now, so for example, the biggest example of this would be when one company lends another company money to buy their products. So if you're a company selling very expensive products like jet engines, then you would most likely sell them on account, or what we call accounts payable, and with the hopes of your customer paying you back at a certain time. So if you're the customer who gets to buy materials on account, this benefits you because you don't have to pay for them right away, and hopefully you can use them and sell them before it's time to pay uh, for purchasing them. Now, accounts payable takes a lot of energy and time to manage properly. So, accounts payable manager is a position that many companies have. So, many companies have a, might have a structure where there's a CFO who hires a accounting controller, who hires an accounts payable manager, who works with accounts payable accountants or staff personnel, and they're going to manage the accounts payable. So, they're because accounts payable is the major source of unsecured short-term financing for a company. And since it's interest-free, companies want to manage it to the best of the ability to take advantage of this unsecured financing. So generally, the bulk of accounts payable will be um, from buying merchandise and raw materials from other suppliers to your company. Now, so there's no formal signed note or contract to show that um, this liability to the seller. Basically, the company is going to buy the raw materials and with a promise to or a handshake to pay you back in your terms. And sometimes the companies that lend you the, the, the um, give you the, sell you the materials, uh, you know, don't get paid back. You know, there, there are plenty of cases where companies just don't pay other companies and litigation has to ensue um, to try to recover that money. But when we look at the average payment period, it's going to have two parts. So the time from the purchases of the raw materials um, from mails the payment, and two, the payment flow time, the time it takes after the firm mails its payment until the supplier has withdrawn with, uh, spendable funds from the the firm's accounts. So basically what we're saying is the supplier will sell the raw materials uh, to another company. Another company will receive the invoice for these raw materials and then hopefully with you know within 30 to 60 days pay the supplier for those materials. So this is what would constitute a payment period or basically how long does it take until I get paid for selling my products. And this is p particularly between business to business, B to B. So if it were worried, wondered what that B2B term is, it's business to business. Because when, if you're at a consumer level as a, as a person buying a product in the store, you know that stores generally don't put, you put an account together for you. You have to pay with your credit card or pay with cash or a check. You can't buy things on account easily as an individual, only this is generally something that companies do. Although in the past, in history, uh, having an account with a store or a tab was something, maybe a tab at a bar was something that businesses would do to attract customers. But today, due to um, the, the popularity of credit cards, 
that's not something co businesses have to do for customers because the credit card company sort of s fills that role in the middle. Now, when we talk about accounts payable management, we're looking at managing the time between the purchase of raw materials and the mailing of the payment to the supplier. So for a company, my accounts payable is somebody else's accounts receivable. So the supplier selling me the raw materials, they, they on their side, they have accounts receivable that's going to correspond to my entries on my accounts payable. So the supplier job is to receive money from me, and my job is, is to pay them the payables to them. So when the seller of goods uh, charges no interest and offers no discount, you the um, to the buyer for an early payment and the goal of the buyer is to, to pay back as slowly as possible without damaging the relationship or the credit rating. Now this allows for you know utilizing this interest-free money for the, the maximum amount of time possible and that's going to save you money. So ideally if you could buy on account the materials you need to make your products and sell them and collect your money from your customers before you have to pay back your suppliers, that would be a very um, good financial position to be in. Typically, it doesn't happen. So um, let's look at this example. Um, this corporation manufactures um, alcohol uh, brands such as Jack Daniels. It has a revenue of $3.8 billion. Uh, cost of revenue of 1.8 billion, accounts payable of 468 million, and the company has an average inventory of 168 days, average collection period of 55 days, and average payment period of 136 days. Uh, so thus, the cash conversion cycle will be 87 days. So you know this would work out to uh, 168 plus 55 minus 136 and that would get us to the 87 days. If we did it in dollar terms we could take the total inventory add to the total accounts receivable minus the, the accounts of payable uh, and we take the amount of days divided by 365 multiply it by the total annual amount and we get the fraction that's outstanding to give the total resources invested in um, <clears throat> in this cash conversion cycle. And you can understand how the, the cash conversion works. Basically, you borrow money, you buy inventory, um, then you the inventory you sell goes on your accounts receivable, and then the money that you've, um, hopefully money you've earned from accounts receivable or money you have goes to pay, paying back the accounts payable. So you want to do this all in a timely fashion. That pr gives you the ability to hold on to the money as long as possible before you have to pay your suppliers. So you want to pay your suppliers in a time, stretch it out as far as you can, and you want to receive your money from your customers as fast as possible to so shorten your cash conversion cycle. So based on this company's APP, average accounting, uh, average accounts payable, <clears throat> if we look at the daily accounts payable, which, is, which we can calculate by taking the uh, 0.48 billion divided by the 136, and we're getting these numbers uh, from back here, that's the um, average payment period is the 136. So by dividing the outstanding, when we talk about this 48 billion, which is the amount that we have invested, we get um, 3.5 million as the average accounts payable balance. So if we were to increase the average accounts payable balance by five days, and we mul now we multiply that average balance by five, we increase it by 17.5 million. So if we could increase that by 17.5 million, the result is a decrease of five days in the, the cash conversion cycle. So reduce our investment operations by 17.5 million. So this action doesn't, if it doesn't damage our credit rating, it would be in our best interest to do that. Now credit terms, uh, if we look at credit terms, it's offered by suppliers to uh, delay payments for its purchases. So if we look at this Lawrence Industries operator of a small chain of video stores purchases $1,000 worth of merchandise on February 27th from a supplier extending terms called 210 net 30 end of month, EOM is end of month. So if the firm takes a cash discount, it pays um, $980, which is the $1,000 minus the 2%, 
by March 10th we'll save $20. So we have to figure out is this worth it? This is something that we should do. Now, so you can understand why a um, supplier would want to offer this because they're trying to get the, their, their collect their money sooner. So they offer a uh, enticement of a 2% discount. Some people will pay within 10 days. That's what the 210 is. You get 2% discount if you pay in 10 days. Otherwise, you have to pay in 30 days. <clears throat> so as somebody who is going to be paying for this, you have to under, you have to figure out, is this $20 worth it for paying early? So the cost of giving up the cash discount is what we call that. Is it is the rate of interest something we could quantify it, not in dollar terms, but in interest terms, to see if the delayed payment uh, uh, of an account's payable account is going to be beneficial. So what we look at, if, if, we, if we're plotting it in days, so on February 27, we make the purchase. The credit begins on March 1st, uh, presumably the time it takes for the, to get the invoice. And then if we pay within the first days, we get the 2% discount. If we pay within 30 days, we pay the full $1,000. So what's the, what's the cost of the additional 20 days? So well, we know the cost of the additional 20 days is $20. So if we pay here, we save the $20. If not, we're paying it. So the $20 is the additional cost. So to calculate the cost of giving up the cash discount, we want to look towards the balance of 980. So what we're going to do is we know that 980 is what we could pay if we pay in 10 days. If we take longer, we're paying an extra $20. So if we simply divide the $20 by the 980, we get this 2.04% uh, transaction rate. And that's that's basically what the interest we pay on a 20-day loan. So if we wanted to um, annualize that, we could use this formula here where we could multiply the rate of interest on the transaction by the number of 20-day um, periods uh, during the year. So the following equation, you know, so CD would be the cash discount percentage and would be the number of uh, days of payment can be delayed and um, by giving up the cash discount. So this would be the formula. And if we, so a simple way to approximate what the cash discount is, we could use this formula. In, in place of the first term, we could just say cash discount. So we could take 2% and we could take 365 divided by 20. So if we take um, the 2% divided by 98 times the 365 divided by 20, we get an approximation of about 36.5%. All right, so the annualized cost of giving up the cash dis discount is 37%. And an approximation, we, c we get to about 36.5, which is we took the 2%, which is this formula here. This is an approximation. So it's not going to be, it's a quicker formula to use than this formula, but it's less accurate. But just sort of a quick and dirty way. And you see that the two numbers are, are kind of close. Okay. So the approximation is, is just, again, a quicker way, a simpler way of getting a number that's close to it, but not as accurate. This number is uh, is definitely more accurate here. So, if we look at Mason Products, a, a large uh, building supply company, and it has four possible suppliers, each offering different credit terms. So here are the suppliers, and here are the different credit terms, and here's the approximation of giving up the cash discount. Okay. So now, if, so we have to figure out of if it's a case where we could choose one of these, which says possible, only one of these, who would be the best to choose? So you, you would see here that in this case, since we have a net 85, the, the cost of giving up the discount is only 4.9%, but here the cost is, um, 36% because of the 30 days. So the day count matters as much as the percentage. So if a firm needs short-term funds, it can borrow from a bank an interest rate of say 13%. So this is what we can compare when we look at these numbers. We're going to compare these to this 13%. <coughs> and if, a, if each of the suppliers is viewed separately, um, if any of the suppliers cast this down, will the firm give up. Okay, so if we're dealing with supplier A, 
the firm takes the cash discount because the cost of giving it up is much higher than the 13%. With supplier B, the firm would do better to give up the cash discount because the cost of this action is less than the cost of borrowing money from the bank. So remember, B, um, I was showing B here as <coughs> 8.1%, but I have here as 4.9. Either way, in both cases, we would want to give up the cash discount because um, it's less than the bank rate. And for C and D, the firm would take up the cash discount because in both cases, the cost of giving up the discount is greater than the 13% borrowing cost. So, I'm sorry about that. So, in these three cases, if these, these three numbers are higher than the cost of borrowing, we should um, take the cash discount. If the if the cost is any, any cost lower than 13%, such as in B, we should give up the cash discount. So just a way of you know quantifying the discounts in the, in an interest rate percentage, so that way you can compare to the rate at which we borrow money at this to figure out whether or not it's worth it. Okay. So stretching accounts payable refers to paying bills as late as possible without damaging your credit rating. So, for example, if you had a number of bills that you needed to pay, but you can't pay all of them, you may look to say, okay, um, I know my rent, my landlord will give me two weeks extra time to pay my rent, and by that time I'll get another pay paycheck from where I'm working, so let me pay these other bills uh, uh, first, and I'll just stretch out my rent since it's my largest uh, payable, and I have some flexibility without really damaging my relationship or credit terms. But I don't want to pay my credit cards late because I'm going to get additional fees and I'm going to have uh, marks on my credit. So it's basically companies do the same thing. So if Lawrence Industries extended credit terms of 210, not 30, the cost of giving up the cash discount as we calculated before using the both methods, but we'll go with the approximation method of 3.36.5%. Uh, 3, so if we're able to stretch it out to the 70 days without damaging our credit rating, um, the cost of giving up discount would only be 12% because now instead of having to pay in 30 days, we're stretching it uh, an additional 60 days. Uh, and that reduces the cost of giving up the cash discount. So it basically the idea is if, if I have to pay in 10 days um, versus 30 days, there's not that big of a difference there. But if you have to pay 10 days early, within 10 days, or wait for 70 days, I, I get more of an advantage waiting because that's more time I'm, I'm holding the money without um, having to pay any penalty for it. So time doesn't matter in these calculations as well. Okay, so for a personal example, Let's look at um, Jack and Mary. So a young couple, they are in the process of, process of purchasing a 42-inch high-definition 4K, I added that, uh, TV for $1,900. The electronic dealer has a special financing plan that would allow them to either, one, put $200 down and finance the balance, $1,700 at 3%, annual interest rate over 24 months, resulting in payments of $73, Per month, or two, receive immediate $150 cash rebate, thereby paying only $1,750 in cash. So, um, the Nobels who've saved enough money to pay cash for the TV are currently earning 5% annual interest on their savings. So, they wish to determine what should they do. Should they borrow the money, or should they purchase the TV outright? Of course, they're going to have to do some calculations. So. The upfront outlay for financing uh, uh, for the financing alternative is a $200 down payment, whereas the nobles will pay out $1,700 upfront under the cash purchase uh, alternative. So let's look at the cash purchase will require initial outlay of um, $1,550 greater than the current financing plan because we're taking the $200 off. Assuming they can purchase the simple interest rate, uh, they can earn a simple interest rate of 5% of their savings. Uh, the cash, the cash purchase will cause them to give an opportunity of earning $155 of interest over two years. So, if they choose the financing alternatives, the $1,550 would grow to $1,705 at the end of the two years if they have it in the 5% paying bank account. Under the financing alternative, the nobles will pay out 
uh, $1,752, which is 24 months times $73 over the two-year term. So the cost of financing, uh, financial terms can be viewed as $1,752, and the cost of the cash payment, including the foregoing interest, would be $1,705. So because it's less expensive, they should pay cash for the TV, um, and the, the lower cost of the cash alternative is largely the result of that $150 cash rebate. So we're not talking about, you know, we're talking about around a $50 difference here. But still, you want to run the numbers. You don't want to just uh, go for the offer you think is best. You should really look at your opportunity cost and the cost of financing. Now let's talk about accruals. So I find that uh, generally students have a harder time understanding what a accrual is. But accrual is basically, it's a liability. So it's some sort of service that you receive. It could be uh, people, employees working for you. It could be um, anybody uh, giving you a service that you, you're, you're accumulating the cost of it, but you're not paying it. So, for example, if you have a landscaper come and landscape your, your yard and you have that done over a course of two months before you pay, the cost of that weekly landscaping is, is, is accruing. So you know that word accrue? That means it's getting bigger. And that's why I call accruals because these are accounts that are accruing liabilities. So firms, the most common is for firms are wages and taxes. So tax payments have to be paid to the government. They can't really be manipulated. There's a due date for that. However, uh, accrual of employees' wages can be manipulated to some extent. So if you wanted to say that instead of getting paid on Thursday, now everybody's going to be paid on Friday, there's a day longer that you get to hold the money. So if you're a huge corporation and you have a $100 billion payroll, that's pretty crazy. Maybe a $100 million payroll, and you get to hold that money for one more day, that can mean a lot um, of extra interest. That one day of interest can accumulate to a lot. So delaying, you know, if you were to delay a full week, that'd be even more money you could save. But how happy will your employees be? Probably not too happy. So this is accomplished by delaying payments of wages, um, and you're getting an interest-free loan from your employees. So let's look at this particular example. The have, we have here... Um, this company is a janitorial service, and they currently pay its employees at the end of each work week. And the payroll totals 400000 So if the firm extends the pay period uh, to pay their employees one week later through the entire year, the, the effect would be uh, lending the firm 400000 for a year. And the firm would earn 10% annually on the invested funds, so they could be worth $40,000 to them by paying a week later. So, but ethics, is this ethical to really, um, you know, purposely manipulate these accruals? So if we look at this particular company, Diebold, agreed to pay $25 million in fines to settle accounting fraud charge brought on the S by the SEC uh, in relationship to um, electronic voting machines uh, that they were manipulating uh, their earnings and their forecasts and ma manipulating um, you know their under reporting liabilities such as commissions and incentive compensa compensation and customer rebates to make it seem like their revenues were larger so again they were uh, manipulating these accruals to make it look like make the company look like they're doing better than they were so we can clearly see that that's the manipulation and that's a that's misrepresenting the true value of the firm to uh, owners or shareholders. Okay, so unsecured sources of short-term loans, one such unsecured source could be a bank loan. So a bank can simply loan companies money. So a short-term self-liquidating loan is an unsecured short-term loan from a bank w um, which is borrowed money but provides a mechanism which the loan should be paid back. So these loans are merely to carry the company through uh, a short period of time. Uh, you know, if they're building up the inventory, they need they need money uh, for a particular period due to seasonality changes in their business, or so a bump in production has to be made. So they need to borrow money to make that because it's going to take them say 90 days to collect the sell and collect money from the that new those new products. Um, a firm can convert inventories to cash, and the funds can be used to retire these loans. So banks lend unsecured short-term funds uh, basically through a single payment note, a line of credit, or revolving credit terms. Now, 
we call the prime rate of interest. So this is the lowest rate of interest charged by banks, lending banks on business loans to their most important business borrowers. So the prime rate, well prime, kind of think of like a prime meet, it means the best. So prime rate would be the best rate they can do. And prime rate fluctuates with changing supply and demand relationships of short-term funds in the general economy and marketplaces. But banks generally determine the rate uh, to be charged uh, to various borrowers by adding or, or adjusting the premiums to the to the prime rate based on someone's riskiness. So the premium may amount to 4% more, uh, um, uh, although most unsecured short-term loans carry a premium less than 2% of prime. So, and you could have two types of loans. You could have a fixed rate or a floating rate. And unfortunately, most students are familiar with loans with their student loans. They know some student loans will have a fixed rate. Some could have a floating rate. Now, a fixed rate, of course, is going to be a set rate that won't change. The floating rate is generally is a lower, generally is offered as a lower rate than a fixed rate, but it can change as, pr as the prime rate changes. So if the prime rate goes up, then your floating loan rate will go up as well. So if we take the interest divided by the amount borrowed, we can get the rate. So the annual rate, uh, so the method, easy method of calculating, of course, is the interest to be paid um, divided by the amount borrowed. Now, when interest is paid in advance, so sometimes this, this is, may sound strange to people because it doesn't really happen in the consumer side, but in the business side, you could get a loan from a bank and have to pay them some interest right away. So um, this is called a discount loan. And to calculate the interest on a discount loan, we take interest divided by amount borrowed minus the interest up front. And this, would be an, this could be an example where if the annual rate of a loan, if we're paying a 10%, a thousand dollars on a, on a ten thousand dollar loan, our rate would be 10%. Pretty simple. But if we had to pay a thousand dollars of interest up front, we're really only getting nine thousand. So that would make that that would make the um, when we're talking about this back here, this discount loan. So this discount loan would really be 11%. And why do banks do that? But it's just a, a one type of way banks lend money. Okay, single payment note. So this is a short-term, one-time loan made to a borrower who needs funds for a specific period for a short period of time. So you would go to a bank and say, I need some funds to meet these goals at this particular time, and they'll you know, buy inventory or pay off this one supplier. So this loan is usually, it's a one-time uh, and you, for you know maybe three months, maybe six months, and it would be called a note. And it's signed by the borrower and states the terms and the length and the interest rate. So generally it has a maturity, it can be anywhere from 30 uh, days to nine months. And the interest charge is usually tied to, in some way to the prime rate of interest. So a single payment note is basically you borrow the money, certain time passes, you pay the money back with interest. Um, if we look at this example, this producer of rotary mower blades, um, borrowed $100,000 from two banks, Bank A and B. The loans were incurred <coughs> on the same day uh, when the prime rate of interest was 6%. Each loan was a 90-day note with interest to be paid at the end of 90 days. So the interest rate was set at 1.5% above prime for Bank A over the 90-day period. The rate of interest in this note would remain at 7.5% because 6% was the prime. A 1 point plus 1.2 would give us seven and a half percent regardless of any fluctuations in the rate. So the total interest on this loan would be the hundred thousand times the seven and a half percent times the ninety days divided by three sixty. So that gives us total interest of eighteen forty nine. Okay, so that which means the ninety day rate, if I take the the amount of interest divided by the hundred thousand gives us one point eight five percent. Because the loan costs one point eight five percent for ninety days, it is necessary to compound it for um, 4.06 periods, which will give us an effective annual rate of 7.73%. Now, if we look at, at Bank B, it only pays 1% above prime. So we're going to do the recalculation based on this 1% above prime. Um, now, if the prime rate goes to 6.5% after 30 days and drops to 6.25%, the firm will be paying point, um, uh, 5.75% 5. Uh, 5. I'm sorry, 
0.75% for the first 30 days, and 0.616 for the next 30 days, and 0.596 for the last 30 days. So the total interest incurred for the 90-day period would be 1.79%. And if I divide that, which is basically the, the interest divided by the total loan. So if we get the effective annual rate for Bank B, it's 7.76. So clearly we would want to take um, we wouldn't want to take bank A because it's a higher rate at 7.73. We'd go with bank B at 7.46. And these are the type of calculations that financial managers have to do. I know they're, they're tedious and boring, but when you have all these different options available to you, you can't just make decisions based on, I'll just go with this or go with that. You have to back it up with that. I did the due diligence. I figured out the rates. And you have to go with it's your duty as an agent in the company to find the lowest interest rate possible. So you'd have to look at all the loans that are being offered to figure out and to do the math that we're showing you here to figure out what would be the lowest effective annual rate. So in a personal financial example, um, we can look at uh, Megan Schwartz. She's been approved by Clinton National Bank for a 180-day loan at $30,000, which will allow her to make a down payment and close a loan on her new condo. And she needs the fund. She needs funds to bridge the time until the sale of her current condo, until she, where she expects to re receive forty-two thousand for the sale of her current condo. So, it, she, you know, so she's facing two financing options for the thirty thousand dollar loan. One, a fixed rate loan at two percent, and a variable loan at one percent. So currently, the prime is set to eight percent. Uh, the forecast for the uh, group of mortgage economists, like they're ever right. For changes in the prime rate over the next 180 days would be one, a half percent, and one percent for these particular time periods. So using the uh, forecasted prime rate change, she wishes to determine the lowest interest rate loan for the next six months. So that's why we, the fixed rate is simple. We would just take the 30,000, a prime plus two percent times the days 180 divided by 365, and we would get a uh, annual interest of 1480 or 4.93%. The variable rate, we'd have to do three, we'd have to do a couple separate calculations for the different periods and different rates of interest, and we'd come up with 1442 total interest or 4.8%. So the variable rate in this case would be the cheaper of the two. Okay. So let's talk about uh, unsecured sources of short-term loans, uh, bank loans. So there is something called a line of credit, which is not so different from a credit card, where a commercial bank will give a business a specific, uh, specific amount of short-term borrowing that the bank will make available over a given period of time. So for the next year, the bank is willing to give a line of credit of $100,000 that the company can borrow from whenever they please for the next year. And the interest rate in this line of credit is normally going to be a floating rate with prime plus a certain amount based on the client's credit worthiness. So some banks may improve, may impose a operating change restrictions, which are, you know, con contractual restri um, restrictions that the bank may impose on the company's financial condition or operations as part of the line of credit. So basically saying that, you know, banks aren't stupid. They're going to make sure the company is not going to change anything so drastically to put their money at risk. And banks also may request a compensating balance where they're going to review the checking account balance. Um, and so they're going to require the checking account uh, balance equal to a certain percentage of the total amount borrowed. So if the compensating balance could be 10%, if we lend you a million dollars, you have to keep $100,000 in, in your checking account or at all times. Uh, and it's not something that's completely um, alien to consumers like us. If you're a consumer, then some bank accounts say, well, you know, in order to get the free checking or the enhanced savings checking account, you need to keep a minimum balance of $5,000 at all times. That's sort of like a compensating balance for these banks to get some of their better benefits. Um, I know that at the Teachers Credit Union, I'll, if I keep a balance of 10000 then I get all sorts of uh, perks, like um, free ATM usage of uh, in-network, out-of-network, a reduction on loans and mortgages, and uh, enhance uh, earnings on savings accounts, things of that nature that will offer. Now, so 
uh, let's look at this example. Extrata Graphics, a graphics design firm, borrows a million dollars in the line of credit agreement. It, um, it must pay a stated interest of 10% and maintain in maintenance and it's in its checking account. Compensating balance equal to 20% of the amount borrowed or 200000 So it's actually receiving only 800000 So to use the amount um, for a year, the firm pays interest of 100000 So the effective annual rate would be 12% or the 100000 divided by the 800000 they're actually getting to use. So that's 2.5% higher than the actual stated rate and that's why compensating balances should be taken into account because it actually does make the money more expensive. Okay, so now unsecured sources of short-term loans, when we're talking about bank loans, if the bank normally maintains a balance, sorry, if the firm normally maintains that balance of 200000 or more in its checking its account, its effective annual rate uh, equals the amount of the uh, 10% because none of the million dollars borrowed is needed to satisfy the compensating balance requirement. So if the firm, so basically, saying the firm, if the firm already has two hundred thousand dollars and it's a checking account because that's just its minimum balance they're going to keep. Then in that case, if they do borrow this this million dollars at ten percent, it's you know, um, then we could look at it in a different light. So if the firm, so it's really going to be ten percent then because we have the two hundred thousand in there anyway. So we wouldn't want to discount the compensating balance if we going to have the money anyway. But maybe we only have 100000 as our minimum balance in our checking account. In that case, we're going to have to keep it another $100,000 to meet the $200,000 uh, maintenance balance um, or what we call that compensating balance back here is the description of it. So if it's 100000 that I have to add to this checking account because of this loan, I'm going to factor in dividing the, the interest by the 900000 because an extra 100000 is coming out making bumping my rate up to 11.1%. So basically, if I have a zero balance in my checking account and I have to keep the full 20% or 200,000, my rate's 12.5. It's 10% if I already have the money in the account anyway, and 11.1% if I need to add, if I had a balance of 100,000, need to add another 100,000 to that account. Okay. All right, so this is gonna be the end of part one, and I will continue with part two in a moment.